Hello, my name's Ian Seeger from Pilot Career News. On the 6th and 7th of November, we held our very first virtual edition of Pilot Careers Live. We streamed over 30 different seminars with 60 speakers. There were two days packed full of great information. Of course, we recorded everything and you're about to watch one of the videos from the, from, from the, from the event. Um, before you do, I just want to thank our sponsors, Bose, Alsim, Entro, and of course, Pulis. Without them and without the exhibitors, it wouldn't be possible. The exhibitor pages are still live, so feel free to head on over there. Go to www.pilotcareerslive.com and click through to the exhibitors. There's loads of information, loads of downloads, all sorts of great stuff there for you. Anyway, enjoy the video, and if you find it useful, really appreciate it if you click subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you, bye-bye. Welcome to this session on APS MCC. But before we get started, just a couple more housekeeping tips for you, if you would. Firstly, please make sure that you go and visit the stands, uh, the exhibitor stands. They've all got uh, people waiting the other side of a chat box to answer your questions and looking at some of the questions coming through. Some of those questions can be easily answered by pretty much everyone there. So please feel free, go and engage with them, ask them your specific questions and they will almost certainly give you answers. And if you want to make sure that you got the right answer then feel free to ask ask a couple of people the same question even so no problem there um, there's a whole bunch of other questions that people are keen to see answered we're collating them we'll deal with them hopefully in the Q&A and uh, if not in the Q&A we'll do our best to deal with them um, in the wrap-up session tonight uh, the chat's back on now um, so please uh, feel free to go and uh, chat and contribute there stay polite uh, play nicely as they say as my mum and dad used to say when I was a uh, Kind of argue with my sisters, I guess. Um, so the whole APS MCC thing is full of a whole load of acronyms. You can throw in AQC as well if you like. Um, all sorts of different bits and pieces there. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start off this session with just a real basic question about what it actually is. I'm going to talk to Rod Wren from Wings Alliance first because he's sitting next to me at a socially distanced distant. Uh, distance as it were uh, and then we'll move over to Jimmy Devon who's sitting in his sim in Dublin I believe so Rod can you give us the basics of MC a bit of history about MCC if you would sure um, so back in the days of, days of JAA so yet another three-letter acronym as we love in aviation um, it was decided that it there needed to be some formalized transition between light aircraft flying where people were flying as a single operating pilot and introduction to the idea of how to operate as, a, as part of a crew. So the MCC course was introduced with uh, the JEA. It was a 10 hour requirement. Um, and to be honest, uh, commercially, very few operators managed to deliver a, a, a longer course. Now in practice, that is just not enough time to transition from single pilot operations to being a uh, first officer or, or acting in command of an airliner. Um, not only that, there are other things to learn other than how to, how to operate as part of two crew. You have to operate an airplane that's going much faster, that's a jet aircraft, that's a little bit slipperier. So there are handling characteristics that needed to be introduced. So fairly often, operators offered an extra course called a JOC, Jet Orienti Orientation Course but it was totally unregulated. So you got excellent job courses and really, really rubbish job courses. Neither of them actually counted for anything in terms of regulatory ticks in a box, but were often required by employers. So about a decade ago, the industry started to get a bit fed up about this, the airline industry that is saying, the standards are not good enough, and put pressure on EASA to develop something better. EASA's response was, if you don't like it, then you recommend something. So a working committee was, was formed. Um, it was chaired by Captain Andy O'Shea, who we heard of earlier, who at the time was um, head of training and standards at Ryanair. It involved a number of me members of the industry. They put together an excellent course and basically incorporated the best practice from the existing JOC courses and MCC courses, and it became called the APS MCC. So from a regulatory point of view, you need one or other of those courses before doing a first multi-crew type rating, unless that training is combined with the type rating. But the airlines do actually prefer the APFs MCC. It is a better preparation. Okay, so briefly, let's just deal with a few of these things. MCC, multi-crew cooperation? Multi-crew cooperation. JOC, jet orientation course? Jet orientation course, yes. APS, airline pilot standard? 
That's correct. AQC? Uh, it's yeah. just a trade name. Just, um, a trade. just a trade name. And uh, one we haven't mentioned yet, but maybe that's just dead and buried and no one talks about it anymore, Loft? Line orientated flight training? Uh, it's a description of a type of training that's done in airlines. It's, it's practicing flying down route on online. So it's a description of a type of training that's still done, but it's not a course called not a course. course. Okay, uh, Jimmy, how are you doing? Good afternoon from Dublin. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. Now, now I can hear you. I'm even better. So uh, perhaps you'd uh, like to start by giving us just a quick introduction to who you are and, and where you're sitting. Great backdrop. Yes, I am, my name is Jimmy Devlin. I'm uh, head of training in SimTech in Dublin, and I'm sitting in the cockpit of an MPS 737-800 series aircraft, fixed base simulator. Fantastic. So it's not a Zoom background then? No, not at all. It's, it's the real thing, as you can see. Okay, and um, Sim SimTech's involvement in APS MCC? Yeah, we, we have two courses here at the moment. We have a basic MCC course, which we do on, a, on an XJ simulator, which is generic jet aircraft. And we have this sim here, which is the for APS, which is a 77-800 uh, standard aircraft. So we're, we're running two courses at the same time. Uh, obviously, crews can choose which one they want to opt for. Okay. And uh... course last. I mean, if someone enrolls on it, how long are they with you? The students do four days ground school and 10 days of simulator. And we obviously give a break in during the simulator session. So the, the total course time would be about 14 days and probably 16 days in Dublin. And the, uh, the ground school, is that, is that kind of a type rating light or is that more about a human factors and the core competencies? It, it's, it's a combination of both. So the first few days are competencies and MCC concepts. And then the last day are about airline procedures, uh, tech on the 7-3, and uh, operators, manuals, and all that sort of thing. Just the generic structure of, according to, say, IASA or whatever it is like that, that they, they, they would know what to look for when they go into their airline. The Excellent. So I'm just looking at the questions we're getting here. There's still a bit of confusion about you know, whether someone needs an APS or an MCC or, or an APS MCC even, uh, and, and my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, um, an MCC is a precondition to a, a multi-crew type rating. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, the preference is really according to the airline that you're going to. Obviously, if you're going to airlines and you have an APS, uh, it's, it's the we call it the, the best, but it doesn't exclude you from airlines. Uh, MCC will still, will still satisfy their requirements. Um, Legally speaking. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're going, as an example, if you're going to a 737 operator and you've done an APS course here, say, you're obviously going to know a fair bit about the aircraft. You, you're not the type rating standard, but you're getting there and you certainly can develop the differences and, and the, the review of the SOP differences and all that sort of thing uh, when you start your type rating. So you're probably slightly ahead of the curve as from someone who's done a generic MCC course. So, so, so given that um, are there any, what are the entry requirements for an APS? Uh, Rod, let me talk to you. Uh, from, from the regulatory point of view, you just need an instant rating. You don't actually need an issued CPL, although I think that not many um, providers would accept someone who hasn't actually got the issued CPL. So CPL and instrument rating. Okay, that's a regulatory point of view. Um, is, is there any other selection done or is it just anybody who turns up and wants one? Uh, normally anybody who turns up and wants one, um, we operate ours slightly differently because it's part of a bigger program and everybody who goes into it is uh, potentially going to be recommended to an airline so they'll have gone through an assessment beforehand. So how, I mean a very sort of simple overview is almost that you can take a number of students from varying backgrounds and you know that's Let's just say there are some schools that are not as good as others, for example. Is the APS MCC a kind of finishing school that brings everyone up to the same standard? That's very much how we use it. Uh, our students are out training for their uh, CPL courses all over Europe. So we have students who are training in the best schools in Europe and some who are training, perhaps uh, their training is not quite as good. So before we can recommend to an airline, we need to be able to bring them up to a common standard um, and they should go into the type rating completely ready. And there aren't many APS MCC 
providers around, I have to say the standard of all is good. And if I were at the other side of the fence in, in an airline, I know that it would give me a, a quality assurance of, um, of, of entrance. Jimmy, so an MCC course, it, at least when I used to understand it a little bit, was a kind of attendance course. Um, there was no exam at the end of it or anything. Um, is, is that different with APS MCC? Yes, APS MCC is actually, we call it evaluated or assessed. So each day you are, uh, your reports are written up and you're also, there's a marking system. So you're giving, giving marks in terms of satisfactory, unsatisfactory or good or very good and that sort of thing. And the last day, day 10, is actually an evaluation of your progress and, and your performance throughout the course. And you do a little, you mentioned the word a lot there, not quite like that, but you do a, um, a, a test uh, um, flight where you get a, a fairly simple sort of uh, operation and, and maybe a, a simple failure and you end up, say, for example, having to divert. So, but you can see all the competencies that have been developed throughout the course. For example, flying a 737 to London, and then diverting to Manchester with a minor technical snag. Okay, and, and do people, are, are people paired during this course? Uh, yes and no. We, we take, say if we take a course in of eight people, that they start off as a group of two and they'll generally stay together in the sim for the, for the 10 sessions together, yes. Okay, okay, thanks. We've just got a question that pops up on the screen, which is basically who pays for an APS MCC? And I'm guessing at the moment the answer to that is very much the, uh, the cadet. Absolutely. I can't imagine many airlines are paying for Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, could, could you both give me, I mean, I'm not asking you to make a sales pitch for your own ATO, but, but rough, rough ballpark, what does an APS MCC cost? Just, uh, just under 7,000 uh, euros in our case, and that may include some element of accommodation and transport to and from the hotel and all that sort of thing. The, the price range of all, all providers is fairly similar, so from about 7,000 to 8,000 pounds in the UK, um, they're, they're all pretty much the same price. Okay, and that's, that's generally, in it, that's clearly in addition to their other training, because they'll go, okay, fair enough. So, when, when do you, when do you, I mean, this, this comes at the very end of their, well, I suppose, it, depending on your holistic view of life, comes at the end of their initial training. Um, do you advise people to do the APS MCC as soon as they've done their CPLIR? Is, is that when they're at their sharpest? Is that when they're going to get most out of it? Ideally, yes. As soon as they've finished their basic training, if they can move on to the MCC course, as you say, their instrument flying and that sort of thing is at the sharpest, um, so that they, they can continue to develop throughout that. And in the ideal world, the next thing, next step is their, their airline application. Yeah. Important point, actually, because at the moment, the, you know, our advice to our trainees is hold off a CPLIR and APS MCC, and then use that to get get current again before applying to an airline. Um, if there's a large gap after an APS MCC before an airline application, you're probably talking about going back to the sim to do some sort of refresher. So if you were, if you were talking to someone who, who already had that gap, for example, and starting the APS MCC, would you kind of almost need a mini foundation refresher to get back? If someone has spent a long time between their instrument rating and starting the APS MCC, then it probably be, would be worth doing some sort of refresher, as, as, as Jimmy says, to make sure their instrument flying skills are up to standard. It's, not that the APS MCC teaches instrument flying, but it, it does expect people to be able to fly instruments well. So, so Jimmy, talking to you, I'm guessing that most of the people who turn up and fly your sim for an APS MCC course would have been flying, I don't know, Duchesses or DA-42s or other twin piston training aircraft. What are the big differences they're going to notice between sitting in one of those and, and flying a 737-800? Well, basically the weight of the aircraft and the sim is realistic in terms of it's the equivalent of a 737-800. So the handling is going to be different. The also the, the, the split of the duty between the pilot flying and the pilot monitoring. Uh, for some of them that can be a bit of a challenge. Some pilots want to do everything themselves. Um, but they, the transition generally works out okay. And we have them here long enough to be able to help them to, to, to elevate their standards to handling the equivalent of the 737-800. So, I mean, 
it seems an obvious question, but I'm sure someone's figured it out before. If when you take people through flying training, it's all about single pilot. It's about flying your your instrument rating test single pilot, and you're training to become an airline pilot, and then you almost get to a stage and go, well, forget the single pilot stuff, now we're going to teach you as a crew. Um, I, presumably the MPL uh, was the intended answer to that problem. Um. The, the MPL was the, was the thing, but then what has happened in recent times, as I understand it, is that because people, airlines have disconnected themselves from recruitment, if you're left with an MPL and you cannot go on to finish your flying um, in the airline, your license the issue of the license may, may be held back, whereas the basic ATPL and all and CPL, that sort of thing, you get the license at the, at that point, you know. So does it? it it's, I'm not fully briefed on it, but that's that I think is is a relevant issue at the moment. Yeah, I think there was. I was going to say that the the other criticism, not necessarily mine, but the other criticism for the MPL is that the CPL route, whether it's an integrated or modular route, does train people in decision making, um, and resilience and uh, a few other things that are going to work, work out well when they're a multi-crew pilot. Um, so the vast majority of people who have gone into airlines over the last few years have gone through a uh, CPL route then they've done a transition course, be it uh, an MTC jock or more recently the APS MTC, and they've done very well in airlines. Um, there have been studies done by a number of airlines, including Ryanair, comparing those from different paths and seeing how quickly they um, they reach a common standard. And within probably 12 months, Ryanair's assessment was they couldn't tell the difference about people's backgrounds, whether they'd done an integrated, a modular route, or an MPL. Yeah, I mean, I guess the whole integrated modular question is a kind of, it's the big question that everyone asks. And I think we've already spoken about the fact there's no real one answer that fits every single solution. Everyone's different, depends sure. how much time you've got, how much money you've got, what your aptitude, all sorts of, what the market's like. Hello, Adam, how are you? Hello, I'm good, and you? I'm very Sorry good. For, for being late, but I was hearing the beginning of your conversation. Uh, Great, Jason. Earlier, but now I'm here, so I'm all yours. Okay, well. I assume we've just been, so anyway, we've been joined by you, Adam. Jason was there, but he's not anymore. Um, we've been talking about APS, MCC, and we, we spoke a little bit about the history of, of JOC and LOFT and, and AQC and a few other bits and pieces. Perhaps uh, as you've just joined us, you could start us by uh, just giving us a bit of an introduction to yourself. Uh, you're a Bartolinier, I believe. Um, yes. So just tell us where you're coming from. So generally, I'm uh, coming from Łódź in Poland, central part. Uh, I was originally born in Łódź, uh, and I'm a co-founder and uh, co-owner of Bartolinier. Uh, I'm also a head of training and uh, flight examiner. So these are the, the main two duties that I have to uh, work on. And so basically, we also provide APS MCC here at Bartolini. However, we do it slightly in a different way so far because we do it on the Airbus. Okay. And pre presumably, uh, J Jim, Jimmy, Rod, Adam, the type of aircraft you do APS MCC on is required to be what? Uh, it needs to be uh, an airliner type. Um, it's, it needs to have uh, jet engines as opposed to a turboprop. Um, it needs to be a certain number of passengers seating. Okay. It doesn't necessarily matter whether it's an Airbus or a, an A320 based simulator, or it could be a generic twin jet. Okay, and I'm, I'm yeah. So I guess it's just a business decision from the from the ATO as to which they choose. It's not a regulatory requirement. It's not an A320 737 kind of thing. Okay, so um, how long does your uh, course last, Adam? Uh, so generally, the whole APS MCC takes around one month, including the Fury. Uh, of course, I'm taking into account also some home study in between uh, the sessions and so on. Uh, the total Fury course is 49 hours, including the 25 hours of the actual classes. Uh, as well. Yeah. 40 hours for the actual course, for the practical. Someone has just, oh, there's a question on my screen that's just disappeared. <laughs> and the, the question was, was a, is, is a, 
is an MCC APS included in an MPL? And I think uh, no, because that whole thing starts as a multi-crew thing throughout the whole thing. So that's a kind of bit of a mixing of things there. Um, Jimmy, when you when you have a, a a cadet or a pair of cadets who pass, what what do they actually take away them? Do they take a, a the, the assessment that is available for them uh, for applications? They get an APS or um, MCC certificate. The filing, the, 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 they have their file available to them under GDPR. We, we obviously, we cannot give it to anybody. We keep the, a copy of the file here for because of our IEA, our regulatory requirement for the files to be inspected. But the ownership of the file is with the student. Okay, and, and that's with them to support applications and stuff in future, I guess. They may or may not request the file. They may just look for the certificate. Um, okay. And Adam, typically how many um, people do you... Th do you only offer APS MCC or do you offer MCC as well? Uh, we, we do both, actually. Uh, APS MCC so far we provide on Airbus. And it's an uh, integrated part of the integrated uh, training. Uh, for the modular part, we do slightly longer MCC, so something in between, 28 hours of practical flights uh, on the Airbus. And this is the regular MCC, so it doesn't include this final assessment and so on. It's, it's still a regular MCC. And clients are, are choosing which, which, which way to go. We plan as well to add Boeing feature, but this will be uh, later third quarter 2021. Is, is your Airbus SIM a, a fixed base SIM? It's a fixed base FNPT2 MCC. Okay. Um, one of the questions earlier was uh, whether the SIM involved in APS MCC was uh, a full motion SIM or not. And uh, no, it doesn't need to be a full motion SIM. I guess you can do one. I hope you, you can do one. them. We used to do one on the 747 full motion SIM, but it's completely unnecessary, to be honest, um, and uh, an unnecessary expense. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Um, so, Starting at the top, I'll just run through here, if I may. Jimmy, or do you offer MCC as well as APS MCC? We don't. We you just do. Don't. You're just APS MCC. For those offering MCC, APS MCC, my guess is that during tough times that we're <coughs> in at the moment, perhaps many people opt for the slightly cheaper option of MCC. Is, is that the case? Or are people, people still, still going for the more uh, involved, higher high quality? Yeah. Call it, that's probably the wrong term, but... No, no, the market changes from time to time. When the airlines were recruiting, say, if you mentioned Brian there, there they, they were favoring, I would say, APS MCC. At the moment, because the recruitment levels are down, as students are, are generally, more generally going for the basic MCC course. Yeah. If you, if you look at the course lengths and all that sort of thing. So at the and moment, we would find the market is, is heading towards more MCC than APS. And unlike ground school, no, you know, if someone if someone got their CPLIR two years ago, there's no time limit before they can do an APS MCC, is there? No, not that I'm aware of. Once their um, MEIR is current, I think is something we'd be looking at. Yeah, that makes sense. And Ad Adam, do you have any selection of people on the course, or do you? Uh... Yeah, so generally we do the we do the selections, uh, we do them quite regularly, and we do them not only for this particular a APS MCC course, but also for, for all other levels of entry to our school. We, just, we do lab and so on, so for, for each level we provide those. A question on the screen there, can you reiterate when a pilot would do an APS MCC? And we've got slightly different uh, opinions here, which is always good, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so let's see if we can see, see if we can get a majority. So, uh, Jimmy, when would you suggest people do the APS MCC? As soon as they're finished their, their basic training, I would suggest it's a good time to move on. Um, I, I know the market changes, the recruitment market changes, but it's a good course to do. It gives you a far better view of what the airline industry or what would be expected of you. And I, I think it's better to do it once you're finished your qualification. If there's a large gap between then and, and the time that uh, you actually go for recruitment, companies like ourselves will, would offer you some level of, of revision and review and some basic handling to come back into the, into SimTech. 
Adam, your view on the same, same question? question? I fully agree. Uh, just to let you know, uh, two weeks ago, uh, my student from last year called me. He got just hired. And, and basically what he told me that he got hired because he actually had all the courses done. Uh, he got hired on a business jet, uh, Premier One. But in fact, out of uh, there, there was a need for pilot uh, because uh, some owner bought, bought the aircraft, they were searching. And because he was all eligible for, he didn't wait when the market grows and so on, waiting for a chance because he was ready. And because of that, because of that fact, he got hired instantly. So I, I think if you're really motivated, uh, I would choose that goal, especially that you can always do some reflection session uh, before any interview. And so. Okay. Well, now you have a slightly different view to that. I do. Um, uh, we're recommending that our students pause, um, preferably before the CPLM EIR, um, but to save up the high value training, CPLM EIR, APS MCC, until the job market looks realistic, so they'll get a job. So right now we're suggesting that people don't do it. So I think just a, a general point that I'm going to step in and make myself here, because there's a few people I can see in the questions who kind of are looking, frankly, and I can understand why, who are looking for the definitive, definitive answer. When should I do this? When should I do that? Should I go modular? Should I go integrated? Should I do MCC? Should I do APS MCC? The fact is, there is no one right answer that applies to every single person. If there was, then we wouldn't need to run events like this. We wouldn't provide two days worth of broadcast stuff. You have to use opportunities like this to gather all of the data that you can and to then make your own decision based on that data. If you were flying, you would look at the weather, you would look at the fuel weight, you would, you would make your decision, uh, or your, some of your critical decisions at least, based on the data that you're gathering and learning to fly is no different. Um, there is no one answer to every, that fits every single person. You have to gather the different data and then make a judgment call. Um, so I, I, I'm sure all of the answers are, are valid and people are coming at it from different points of view. Um, so it's important to get a, a kind of holistic thing. There's a question here um, that someone's asked again that we, we asked at the beginning of the session. We're just going to go over it again, if I may, and I'm pointing this one to you, Rod, um, just to go over the differences between an MCC and an APS MCC. MCC is the minimum requirement before doing the crew type rating for the first time. Yep. Um, it is a minimalist course, um, and generally the airlines would prefer people to do more training. So the APS MCC is now a regulatory controlled course, which expands on the basic MCC and gives people more line orientated flight training. It gives them more of an insight into the real role of a first officer in an airline. And, and it will generally be a much longer course. It's a, it's a, it's a minimum of 40 hours in a sim, um, so it's going to take three to four weeks to get through. It is a more expensive course, um, but as you say, it, it is horses for courses. We had a recent graduate who had a job offer, needed an MCC course, asked us whether he should do our APS MCC course. We sent him to one of our competitors to do a basic MCC because that's all he needed. Because that's all you needed that's all for he the type rating. Yeah, no, excellent. Um, Adam, is there, if, if you were talking to someone who was going to apply, or not to apply, who was going to come and do your APS MCC course, is there any advice you could give them um, before they start? Is there any reading they could do around it? Is it in, in your case, should they be reading books about flying Airbus? Uh, I mean, uh, the whole uh, Airbus MCC training is quite a difficult thing because when we were designing the course, that was the most difficult part. Like where to make a border, how to divide this course, uh, how much to teach them the systems, and uh, how much to actually teach the, the MCC skills. And it's not so easy. I, I think Boeing is a much easier approach because it's, it flies like regular Cessna, let's say. Of course, more sophisticated systems you've got inside, but, but it flies like a regular airplane. Now, Airbus type is, is regulated by so many laws and, and procedures and so on. So, so we had to really go through, through all the manuals and really decide. And I think we, we did it quite well. We balanced it such a way that people are not overloaded with the aircraft knowledge system, but they can also um, get the, the advantages of, of Airbus. Majority, our clients are those who are planning 
go for a type rating course later on related to Airbus and, and they see a real value to do it on the Airbus because already they are a slightly higher level later on when beginning the type rating course. And, but, but presumably there's, if you do, the, if you do the, your APS MCC on the Airbus um, and you get a job on a Boeing, there's no big issue with uh, then going and doing your type rating on a 737. And the same for Jimmy, if you're doing a 737 APS MCC, then plenty of people who have done that would have gone on to Airbus type ratings. The, the transition, say, from a Boeing to an Airbus, it, it, I mean, it, it's not that hard simple terms and they're, they're well able to cope with it. Um, I mean aircraft systems even though Airbus and Boeing present differently each engine has a hydraulic pump and a generator and all that sort of thing so um, knowledge they learn say on a 7-3 it can be transferred onto an Airbus. Excellent I have a question here. Is it true that Ryanair would only accept new pilots if they have an APS MCC? I think you probably need to ask Ryanair that, and if it was true at one time, it may no longer be true now. I don't know. Well, they're not currently recruiting, but they didn't insist on it being an APS MCC. They did have a preference for APS MCC graduates, but it wasn't a requirement. I guess given that Andy O'Shea, who was head of training at um, Ryanair, uh, had, a, had a large hand in bringing the APS system through EASA, um, they would have would have liked it quite a lot, I imagine. They did, but on the other hand, it wasn't just a preference. They did uh, assess the success rate of the pilots coming through from various routes, and there was a much higher percentage pass rate with APS MCC graduates than MCC graduates. Yeah. yeah. J Jimmy, um, we're, we're not too far off of needing to wind up at the moment. Um, but before we do, perhaps you could um, give a few pointers to people who've either in their training or about to start their training um, about, you know, what can they do to get the best out of the APS MCC course? I get the impression that some people I've spoken to in the past might have said, you know, I've done my training, MCC, turn up, get the certificate, go, I just need to tick that box. And it just seems like a missed opportunity. What, 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 can, can, what can pilots do to really get some value out of it? Oh, absolutely. Once they decide they're going to do the course, for example, if they sign up with us, they're going to get um, advanced copy of, of the course itself and they can start looking up, say in our case it's the 737-800, they can start looking up online at, at the various systems that are in the aircraft. They also, another good thing, suggestion might be if they have completed their training at a, head, at, at a training school, they should go to their, their head of training and get a, a, an individual assessment of their capabilities, their competencies and their challenges, be it in uh, instrument flying or be it in personality. The third thing I might say to you is that not everyone first language is English so there is an area that we find challenging for people who come to us and they're they're working hard they're doing their best but their natural understanding of what you're trying to instruct them isn't first hand it, it's easy for us who were born and bred and spoke English from day one but if you're if your language your first language is French or German or Italian uh, it can be quite challenging even though you're operating at the ELP level minimum four but four and five can be quite challenging Another thing, obviously, we would feel recommend that you do a course in a in a school that you know where it's, it's done through through English because uh, and, and the, so that you're actually improving your English as you go along. Absolutely, Adam. How about your uh, top top tips for people to get the most out of their APS MCC course? So generally, uh, to first of all, to to, to get ready to, to be really prepared for the course. Because although <clears throat> uh, it's much longer than, than the regular MCC, but still it's a quite a demanding course. It requires from us certain uh, knowledge, skills, understanding, uh, as it was said before. And without this individual input made at home on, uh, on some uh, trainers, etc., the, the outcome won't be the same. So, so I think a lot of motivation and... and, 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 uh, and the willingness to study sometimes difficult systems, sometimes difficult bits, uh, and then the outcome will be really great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rod? Um, I think I'd echo, echo what the other two guys have said. Um, we try and make sure our course is accessible to someone who hasn't had prior preparation. We do give them a, a package of information, um, but it is a really intense course. Um, by the time people finish it, they're usually quite exhausted. It's, uh, it's pretty full on, 
and be prepared to work really hard in the first few days in grammar school, um, learning the profiles, learning the SOPs as, uh, um, that you're taught on whatever type it is, will really help when you get on the simulator phase. So be prepared for some long nights in those first few days and you can get ahead of the curve on the course and it will be a great course. Okay, so outside of the technical skills required of flying the heavier aeroplanes, the faster aeroplanes, and, and, and how difficult is it in general for people to adapt from going a single pilot instrument I, I, IR flight test that they've just taken to operating as a crew, um, pilot flying, pilot non-flying? How much of a hurdle is that? Jimmy? Jimmy? Well, for some people it's not a hurdle. They fit into it very naturally. And, but for other people, it's quite a challenge where they're, they're so used to single pilot operation and making all the decisions themselves, they find it hard to work in a devolved operation where they're sharing, um, sharing the role. So it, it, it can be a challenge for some people, for others, it's just a natural fit. But we work on them with that. We make them understand why, for example, a 77-800 is such a complex aircraft that it needs two pilots. Why some why some roles and functions and SOPs have to be clearly devolved or evolved and uh, so that everyone knows what the role and function in the cockpit is. And Adam, it seems to me that, I mean, it, teaching someone to fly an ILS in an Airbus or, or a Boeing is one thing and you have an SOP and, and stuff like that, but teaching people to work as a team uh, is might almost be more difficult in extreme cases. Um, how, how do you kind of handle the human side of things? I mean, uh, yeah, you're totally right. Uh, uh, two days ago, I was on a football match of my son. He is right now eight years old. And at this stage, a lot of those youngsters, they, they also would like to become messy. And they are, they are playing like a single, single player instead of... Uh, a team uh, because they want to show off as the best. Sometimes we see it also in the inside the cockpit, especially if we have a composition of two pilots. One is with a slightly greater experience; the other is, is just finished uh, the, the civilian course. And uh, especially the, 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 this this more experienced pilot very often wants to do more, or or like is overtaking the the, the less experienced pilots and and the key role here is for, from the instructor to, to really create an open atmosphere of, of a teamwork. Uh, there should be leadership, but it doesn't mean that one pilot should take all the functions of the others. It should be equally shared. So, so the, the contribution to this training is, is, is the same. So, so of course, we want to emphasize leadership, but also we don't want pilot to, to, to overtake all the functions of the other pilots. And, and it has to be well balanced. It's tricky. Does, is, is, that a, is that a problem you've encountered in the past? or um, yeah, Some people find it very easy. Some people take a little while to adapt. It's what the course is all about. Um, it is the essence of it. it um, the other thing people get out of it is they're, they're learning not just how to operate with another pilot, but how to operate in an airline. These courses are delivered by current airline pilots. You're getting away from the general aviation view that they've had for the last two years, and learning what the real job is going to be. It's a lot of fun, this course. Uh, hard work, fun, um, learning to work with someone else, but learning what the real job is that you spent two years and an awful lot of money preparing for. Talking of an awful lot of money, there was a comment here that someone's put in a comment saying, UPRT and now APS MCC, just more money for the poor student to find. Well, unfortunately, there is an amount of truth there. Um, these aren't courses that have been invented by schools uh, in order to get more money from you. These are courses that are regulatory requirements, and um, they're regulatory requirements, and gone through the regulatory process generally for good reason, and generally to improve safety. I mean, airline safety is just ridiculously safe at the moment. Uh, and that's as a result of, of all the progress training and, and technology and everything else. So, uh, um, so lastly, any, any, we, we're kind of just running up on time. Any last tips, any last reminders that you want to give to people starting at the top, Jimmy? I would always say if you're coming over to a course like to us or something like that, go to your head of training, get your own assessment from them so that when you come over, you know the challenge that you have to face, whether it's instrument flying, whether it's, it's personality based and all that sort of thing. So that, as, as someone else said earlier, that you're, you're set up to work hard, to learn a lot and to, 
to set yourself up ready for hopefully what is your the next step, which is your airline engine. Thank you very much. Last word of wisdom. Yeah, I, I, maybe just to, to, to finish the what was said before, it's uh, just enjoy this course because it's really enjoyable course. Even if it's demanding, at the end you will see when 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 you click and it, you start to operate in this multi crew environment, it's very enjoyable. So, so keep this positive attitude. <laughs> Last word, Rod. Do it. Um, you know, don't do an MCC course. Do an APS MCC course. There's a reason we only offer the one. Although our whole raison d'etre is saving students money in this area. Do not skip. It's the best course you do. Okay, well, uh, on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the panellists for contributing. Uh, thank you for everyone who's asked questions. And uh, don't forget, you can pop to the stands and talk to people. Um, everyone here's got a stand, so you can talk to them direct if you've got any questions. Another big thank you to our sponsors, uh, Bose, Poolies, Alsim, Entrol. Thank you very much. And thanks for listening. And we'll catch you later on in the day.